It's okay, everybody. I think it's time to start. Thank you again for coming to another one of our virtual simulation lab seminars. Today, I'm happy to introduce you to Andre Voigt from the Department of Biotechnology. Uh, today, he's going to talk about using Python for complex network analysis. Now, some of you may out there think, be thinking, I don't work with networks, but chances are you might, because you can pretty much imagine many systems as networks of things. So just think about that while Andre speaks, how you can make a connection of this to your own work that you do. There might be an opportunity for that. So with that, I'll quit speaking and give the floor over to Andre, and uh, hopefully you enjoy the seminar. All right. Um, can you hear me well in the back like this? Is this a reasonable voice? Okay, good. Uh, yeah, so Brian's already introduced me. Um, I'll use this lecture to uh, introduce you to um, complex network analysis in Python. First, a uh, first part of what are networks and how can they relate to your work, and a second part which is a bit more hands-on on using a specific set of software called NetworkX to actually analyze this stuff in Python. So to begin, what do we mean by network in this context? So networks are a general framework for studying systems consisting of multiple interacting entities that we describe as nodes, and this figure represented by these points here, and that interact with each other through various mechanisms. Uh, these interactions are modeled as edges. The way it works, as you see, is an edge con uh, contains two nodes, uh, no, links, two nodes. And this is quite synonymous with, with what's described as graphs and like the mathematical background to this. Um, but people like networks is something that's quite common. People associate a lot with computer networks, which are very physically linked to this representation. Like a computer is a point node linked by a wire in some uh, way that makes the computers com communicate. Um, but there are a lot of other types of networks you can have. A few other examples, air transport networks, where airports are nodes and links are, uh, are connected to flights between the airports. Acquaintance networks, where um, you know some, like you link two people, which are the people are nodes, and they are linked if they know each other. A, tip, uh, a common example of that is the finding us, or the fact that it's called six degrees of separation. I don't know if really you can call it fact, but it's a general observation that any given two people randomly anywhere on the world will at most need to go through, uh, through five or six intermediaries in terms of acquaintances before you can reach that other person. Um, my understanding here is that uh, the people here are mostly biologists and chemists. Um, and, and an example of something that's a bit more relevant is uh, metabolic networks, uh, which is quite linked to what I work in, where nodes are chemical reactions. And, uh, and um, as says elements here, I mean edges are chemical compounds. So two reactions are linked if the product of one is used by the other reaction. Uh, as an example here, this is a very simple network. And what, so I, I'm a little person for the audience here. Uh, what do you think this network represents based on the tags? Central Europe. Pretty much, yeah. I would more say Western Europe, specifically the six uh, founding members of the European Coal and Steel community, which later became the EU. Um, and so what do the edges represent? Edges, boundaries. Borders, exactly. Um, so this is a simple visualization. Um, but that is the thing. It's, networks are a very abstract framework. Uh, you don't want to really focus too much on the visual aspect of things. If you see these three different network representations here, they're all the same network as on the previous slide. The information, from a network perspective, the information here is exactly the same. Um, if you see here, we actually did the layout of it to represent the spatial orientation of the countries on a map, but that is not something that is a constraint when you're actually looking at networks. Um, on the bottom edge here, or the bottom half of the page here, is what's called the adjacency matrix, which is a perfectly equivalent that way of representing a network, which is much less visual and much more mathematical. As you see here, uh, elements of the matrix, which are one, correspond to countries that border, so for instance here, France and Belgium, C represented by an edge here, while zero, for instance, uh, means that the countries are not linked or do not border each other. So, looking further at a few different types of network, because on it, like this basic structure here does have a couple of variations on it. The first variation we want to look at is what's called a weighted network. 
in a weighted network, um, you uh, qualify uh, an edge by a numerical quantity. That quantity can be whatever you feel is relevant to that specific setting. For instance, as a, even for a given network, that the, the relevant weight can change. For instance, if you're a passenger, oh, thank yes, you. Too, he's right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, as a passenger, um, you might look to minimize the cost of traveling from A to B, in which case the, um, the edge weight corresponding to a given flight would be the monetary cost of it. Other people that have, some, like, have more money or have someone else paying the ticket for them might be more uh, focused on minimizing the flight time, in which case the time would be the edge weight. So for instance, an example what we could use as an edge weight in the previous country network would be the length of the border on the notion that a longer border is sort of more relevant and more important than a very short border. Um, so that's like the example of weighted networks. Um, another variation on networks is what we call the directed network. Uh, so in a directed network, you distinguish um, an, a direction on um, on an edge. A good example of this is, for instance, if you want to contrast social media, Facebook versus Twitter. I imagine everyone here is reasonably familiar with both and how users can be like, in, like what would be a reasonable link between two users on Facebook? For in, the friendship relationship, which is an undirected relationship because if you're friends with someone on Facebook, they're friends with you in return. Uh, on the other hand, on Twitter, the basic relationship between to users is that of a follower. And just because you follow a user doesn't mean they follow you in return, and that is in turn an example of a directed network. Um, as you can see here, um, it is entirely possible for a link to be reciprocal as well, but in this case they are counted as two separate links. This is relevant when we come over to our next, uh, next distinction, is between simple networks and hypergraphs. Uh, we're not going to show too many examples of this in this lecture, but the simple network is essentially a network in which uh, nodes only connect to other nodes and only do so either not at all or once, which means that between, like a node doesn't link to itself and, and, uh, and unless it's a directed network in which you can have two separate links, one going each way, uh, you're not going to have several parallel links connecting the same two, par the same two nodes. Uh, the opposite case is what's called a hypergraph. In a hypergraph, these types of interactions are allowed. Um, it's just something I'm bringing up because it can be relevant uh, depending on what field you're in, but we're not going to show a lot of examples uh, in this lecture. Um, as a final note, I just want to point out that the terms weighted, direct, and simple are, are disjoint uh, concepts. You can have a weighted uh, directed network, you can have an unweighted directed network, you can have either a combination of this. Uh, that you see fit or that is appropriate for your, uh, for your system. So, uh, moving into a little bit of how we deal with this. Network science is inherently computational because on two, uh, two major elements. First of all, uh, networks is all about analyzing large systems of interacting partners, which means that computationally we can end up in quite complex scenarios. If you have a network that consists of thousands or even millions of nodes, and I've worked on networks that consist of millions of nodes, you can't do that type of math by hand or solve it analytically. Um, so what you do, you feed in the computer. And this is something that's actually pretty easy because networks are, consist of discrete elements. Node, like you can represent a node sim very simply as an object with a given data structure in any programming object or any programming language you want. And same with edges. Um, so it's quite easy to do software to do this kind of analysis. Um, and a lot of tools exist already, and these can be divided into two main categories, graphical software and command line software. Uh, the advantage with graphical tools is that for people that don't have a like, solid background in programming and computers, it's a bit easier to figure out. Like you can press a button as a node instead of like reading up documentation on what kind of arguments you pass into a function and so on. Uh, another nice thing that networks do is that they allow you to visualize, like every graphical piece of software I've, I've seen provides a, an easy venue for visualizing the network you're looking at, which often can be a quite handy tool. And then you can move nodes around as you see fit to give like as the best possible visual representation. The drawbacks of a lot of these graphical tools is that obviously uh, they need to render graphics. 
um, which is generally, uh, generally requires quite a bit of resources, especially problematic if you're trying to run this on a remote server. Um, and also, also that just because you can visualize a network doesn't necessarily mean that that visual, visualization is going to be meaningful. If you have thousands of nodes that are densely connected, you're most likely just going to end up seeing what we call a hairball, which is just like a dense cloud of nodes where you can't really in, like, identify individually prominent nodes. Um, a few examples of this kind of software, graphical software, are Cytoscape, which is originally meant for a lot of biological network analysis, but it does have this base functionality. Uh, like it, it's capable to, of computing known quantities that are relevant to, to all types of networks, uh, as well as Gephi and Payek, which are more general purpose in their scope. So I'm mentioning Cytoscape in particular because Cytoscape does have the advantage that it has a very a good system for uh, users to add plugins. So you're not as limited in terms of functionality of the base software. If you need it to do something that it doesn't do on its own, chances are you're gonna find a plugin that does it. Um, so the next group, which is what I'm gonna focus on uh, in the demonstration here, is command line tools. Uh, the advantage of a command line tool or a graphic tool is they generally run faster. Uh, they're good if you wanna do a lot of things in sequence, if you wanna read a network, you want to filter out a set of nodes, you want to do math on them, and what you can do is you can just write a script that does that in turn, and then you can leave your computer uh, on for the night and go home. Uh, versus often in a graphical uh, tool, you need to like manually go through menus for everything you want to do. Uh, and similarly, if you know how to program, you can easily um, write functions that do, uh, that do what you want to do if the base toolkit doesn't provide that. The major drawback, of course, of using command line tool, if you're gonna start programming, is you need to know the language that tool is written in. Uh, so a few examples here are Network X and Graph Tool, which are uh, libraries for Python, and WGCNA, which is a mostly uh, genetic, genetic network analysis tool uh, that's written in R. And as an example, I have very limited uh, experience with R, and that's a problem I've had whenever I've tried to write things in, or do things in WGCNA is yeah, I don't know how to write R, simple as that. So what I'm going to be focusing on is, as a um, tool is Network X. Um, so Network X is a network analysis library for Python. Um, it has a lot of things going for it. First of all, Python, in my experience, is a very easy language for beginners to learn. Um, and Python is also very much built on philosophy that you can import things to do everything for you. You have to write very little uh, yourself. Network X absolutely does that. It contains a lot of functions for most basic things you want to figure out uh, when studying a network. It has a very good documentation. It has like, the, yeah, the web page where it contains good examples on how to call every given function and it's easily accessible like that. It's free and open source, so you don't really have to struggle with licenses. And even though it's a command line tool, it does interface with existing Python libraries to do visualization. And the drawback uh, compared to maybe other uh, software uh, or command line software is that Python itself is an interpreted language which is not famous for its, uh, its effectiveness. Um, it can run a bit slower than if you were to write your own code in C++. But by and large, for a Python-based language, it, uh, it works quite fast. And a lot of this has to do with the fact that the base structure, um, the base data structure in Network X is the dicts. You access everything in Network as dicts. I will show that uh, in the next few slides. The drawback of this is that this whole dict structure does um, make it quite re re um, intensive in terms of memory usage. Uh, normally, in my experience, working on a mix of standard desktops and, and not exactly clusters or supercomputers, but more like powerful uh, general purpose computers, um, um, computational time is going to be, like anything that's going to eat up all your memory is also going to take weeks to compute. So it's not... In practice, it's not a, a problem that often unless you're parallelizing things uh, intensively. So, a little example of how to create a network using Network X. I'm going to bring up a couple of terminals here. Uh, oh. All right. So, let us now try to create the network shown on this slide. 
So this network, uh, it wasn't as visible as I would hope, consists of five nodes labeled A, B, C, D, and E. Uh, they're not representing anything in particular. And yeah, and they're connected reasonably sparsely. So, oh, here we go. Um, start up the Python shell, uh, use whatever you want for that. Import network X as an X loading library. And so the first thing we want to do is initialize the network. To do that, we can call the g equals nx.graph function. Uh, the nx.graph is um, a data structure that's used by network X to store um, undirected networks. Uh, network X has four typical, uh, four basic um, data structures for storing networks, which are uh, which roughly correspond to normal uh, or um, undirected networks, directed networks, uh, hypergraphs, and directed hypergraphs. Uh, it doesn't outright um, distinguish between weighted and unweighted networks, but we can show how to do that in a few minutes. So it once we initialize the what? Is it pull the terminal up? Like maximize it? No, or no, drag it up so they can drag, drag it up with the screen. Oh. So you can see the commands are at the top. Oh, yeah, okay, fair enough. All right. Uh, so, uh, what we can start with in order to create this network is we add a node. We can add node A uh, simply by calling g dot add node A. There we go. Now it simply consists of a node A. In order to connect with something, uh, we need another node. We can, for instance, uh, add node C and connect with that. So g dot add node C. Now we're actually going to add node E to prove a point later on. Um, here we go. And then we can do G dot add edge A E. If we now look at G dot nodes, that lists every node in our current network, A and E, and G dot edges shows the edge. A to E. Um, we can also simply add an edge in, uh, with nodes that don't exist in the network already. We can now, for instance, add G add edge C to B. And you see that I added the C B edge as well as nodes C and B, which didn't exist in the network already. It does that on its own. Um, since adding nodes individually can be, or edges a bit individually can be a bit tedious, uh, we can add them in bulk by doing g edges from, and then we do, what are we missing? We're missing a, d, and a, c. Now we see we, uh, we, this represents a whole network. Uh, pretty basic stuff as of now. Um, so we wanted to analyze this network a little bit. Um, so what we, the first thing we can have network X find out for us is what's called the degree. The degree is something that's often quite interesting when you're looking at individual nodes or looking for in, important nodes in a network. It's a pretty simple, uh, it's a pretty simple uh, definition. The degree of a node is simply the number of neighbors it has, or equivalently the number of edges connected to it. So, for instance, here we can see that node A has degree of three. We can we see that visually. So we can look it up in network X, see how it does that. Uh, so we can call nx dot degree g a returns three. Pretty straightforward. Um, a couple of related terms for uh, for uh, directed graphs. Uh, we replace the term degree by the in degree and out degree, respectively, um, which or in and out degree corresponds to the number of incoming links and number of outgoing links. That it's quite possible to imagine um, a direct network in which a node is very prominent in terms of incoming links, but not particularly prominent in terms of outgoing links. Um, but we're not really going to talk too much about the direct networks either. So now we have this network. Um, if we want to work on it later, 
uh, we can uh, sort the file. So we can do call annex or write edge list g and then like this. We can now go, we can exit, restart again, import Python again, and g equals And we see we have the same network as earlier with a couple of modifications because it's, or yeah, equivalent modifications simply because when it stores it, uh, messes a bit with uh, the string format, but it will, it is topologically the same network. Um, now the choice of file format is something that's quite important when you're working on these files. Um, yeah, there we go. Um, so there are three main file formats I want to discuss here in the context of Network X. It's the edge list, um, which is, I'll show you that one here. So this is the previous network in the edge list format. It's pretty simple. Uh, each row corresponds to an edge. And uh, the first column is one of the nodes. The second column is the other node. Very straightforward, very easy to read. And it's also quite compact if you want to store a large network. Um, another format is the adjacency list, quite similar in its philosophy. Uh, it just lays things out a bit differently. Is, yeah, so the adjacency list essentially lists node by node. And for each node, it lists its neighbors unless it has been listed earlier. So you see here that A is listed with C, E, and D, which are its neighbors. But on C, on C, it doesn't list the CA connection on the C row because it's redundant with respect to, since it's all, that information is already contained in the A row, which means it's a bit more compact, but it can sometimes be a little bit hard to search through if you want to look at the text files directly. Um, lastly, we have a few more, slightly more complicated um, languages uh, or file formats. Uh, such as GraphML, which is a markup language, looks like this. So as you can see, this is again the same network, but not no more, uh, in, like no more information. Um, and we see that first of all, the file is much bigger, which can be substantial when you're getting to the millions of nodes and files that can easily run into a couple of gigabytes. But the benefit of this is you can easily store a lot of extra information. You can store things like edge weights, you can do that in the, in the edge list format as well. Uh, but also you can store node attributes. The problem with an edge list format is that the, node is defined, the network is defined entirely in terms of its edges, which means that any isolated nodes that don't connect to anything else, if you want to keep them, they're not going to be able to be stored in an edge list format. And you can't store descriptors of, um, of nodes. So let's say if you're doing a network of countries, as we showed earlier, you might want to say, all right, we want to, to store the population of each given country because that's relevant to our analysis. You can't do that in edge list format. But in a graph markup language format like this, you can do that. Um, but another drawback with using uh, GraphML, for instance, is that <coughs> different implementations don't always work very well. So I can now, uh, for instance, try to read um, a GraphML file I made in Network X. So, uh, uh, and it does that just fine, no problem at all. Now, I, I went into Cytoscape created the same network there, same topology, had Cytoscape write down the, uh, the GraphML file for that. And what do we get if we try to read that into um, into network X? We get errors because the file, like the way the programs work is they don't 
do things exactly the same way. Um, so in my experience, unless you have information you absolutely need to, uh, to, to include, edge lists are very nice to work with. Uh, they're as foolproof as you can get. So returning further to this notion of node and edge attributes. So again, on the base level, a network is a very simple structure that you can define simply by an adjacency list, or an adjacency matrix, or an edge list, or whatever you want. But sometimes you want to um, have more information in the network than simply um, what node connects to what. And so the way Network X does this is that it stores nodes at node attributes in a separate dict at the top level of the graph data structure, and it stores edge attributes as a, uh, as a subdict of uh, the edge element. So I can show a bit how this works in practice. Now, um, for instance, um, we can want to set the weight of the, let's see here, show an edge. So we can do, um, if we want to set an edge attribute for, all right. Uh, so, instance of an edge attribute we can use is what's called the between the centrality. The between the centrality of an edge is essentially how um, how many of the shortest paths through a network goes through it. It's often a term like it's interesting. For instance, if you're looking at different types of infrastructure, because you want to know what are the most load-bearing edges in that infrastructure. That's something called the edge between centrality. So first we can compute that for, uh, for our network by calling the edge between centrality. Now, here we go. So we have this shows the relative prominence of each given edge. We can now store these as edge attributes in the network by calling the set between the centrality, or set, um, sorry, set edge attribute. So, and then we add network. We add the tag for the attribute, and lastly, uh, an index, or a list that contains uh, the values in themselves. So if we now want to see, uh, look this up in the data structure, we can go into but if you want to know the edge between the centrality of the AC edge, we can go G A C and we'll list here so we can access it in this way. Um, node attributes are stored uh, slightly differently because as you see here, the base structure of a network X is that, or a next network X object, is that um, it's a dict of dict. So the network object is defined itself. The nodes are dictionary elements of, um, are dictionary elements of that object. So we see, for instance, uh, G A. Is an element which contains all the edges, and the edges themselves contain the edge attributes. The problem here then is that the node element, what's containing that is only the other edges. It's not in the node attributes. So if you want to find the node between the centrality and store that as uh, as a node attribute, so you can do that set equals. No, no, if we look at that set, that shows things on a node-to-note -note basis. We can set uh, yeah, we can do okay. Yeah, one parent is too much. There we go. So if we look at G A. The between centrality of node A doesn't show up. Instead, we need to go into the node sub element. And here we find the, um, 
the, the node attributes for node A. Um, this is, yeah, th this is a slightly confusing aspect of it that you don't access node and edge elements in the same, uh, attributes in the same way. So it's important to keep that in mind. Um, so, a, few, a couple of examples of things we can do in terms of um, attributes. I'm not going to linger too long on this because there's a lot of functions and whatever is relevant is probably something you're going to have to look up at the time you're studying this. Um, let's see here. Let me know if there's something, if things go too low to be visible. So, um, we can read in this network, which I have conveniently stored in a previous file. Um, as you see here, this is this network. Um, and we can, for instance, find what's called the clustering. The so clustering of network is the tendency um, for uh, for triplets of neighbors uh, of nodes to be connected to each other, uh, or rather, the tendency for if a node is connected to two separate to two others, what is the likelihood of those two nodes being connected to each other? Uh, as an example, here we can see node four. Um, no, let's see. An example here. Oh well, yeah, node, node four has intermediate clustering because you see that node one and five are, are connected together. Um, like node four connects to both one and five, which are connected to each other. Connects to four and six. Node five and six, which are also connected to each other. But also you have the combination four to three and four to six, where you have no third link that exists. So we can figure out the clustering uh, for the whole network. And here we find the clustering coefficients for each individual node. As you can see here, node six, uh, no, sorry, node seven and eight have one as clustering, and that's the highest possible value because every neighbor of seven uh, and every node that neighbors seven connects to every other node that neighbors seven, specifically five, six, and eight. Like they are all connected to each other. Um, other things you can find is yeah, average path length, that's a pretty straightforward uh, thing to, like, uh, quantity. We have things called cliques. Uh, an example of a clique here is, so a clique is a, a set of a given number of nodes which are all connected to each other. So that they can form together what, what's called a complete graph. A complete graph is a network where all nodes connect to all other nodes. Um, and you call, call something an n clique, where n is the number of nodes in that clique. An example of a three clique here is one, two, and four. They all connect to each other. Similarly, five, six, seven, eight form a four clique because you have four sets of nodes or four nodes that form a complete graph together. There are no five cliques or higher in this graph. Uh, obviously, also every four, every n clique consists uh, has um, has similar cliques for every value lower than n. So, for instance, we see that the Four clique here consists of several um, three cliques. Five sets, since they're in the same four clique, they're also in form three three cliques together. Um, I'm not going to go through all of these quantities here, but that's just a list of things you can do um, in terms of network analysis. Next thing we can try to figure out is what uh, look at is what's called connected components. Um, in networks, we, term, we use the term connected components to, uh, to describe um, s sections of the same network or of a given network that are entirely disjoint from another and where there's no way of reaching uh, one net or one section from the other. So here we have two components. We have this is a first component and second component, and there is no way to move from the second component to the first and vice versa. Uh, this is something we frequently want, want to identify in a network. Um, that's something we can do pretty straightforward. So, as an example, I'm going to show you this network. This is a network of um, co-expressed genes. It's a project I've spent quite a bit of time working on and just got my paper out for. And as you can see here, let's full screen this. We have 
one giant component here, which consists of the majority of the network, a few smaller components here, but that are still substantial, and a bunch of sets of uh, isolated gene pairs, which all form distinct components, even if they're pretty trivial networks and just being disjoint three cliques or edge pairs, or node pairs. Uh, so let's say we want to figure out how many nodes, or which nodes, or which genes are in this giant component. So we can read in the corresponding network. So for instance, if one see how many nodes are in this, 1,800 nodes, so it's a bit too much to list all at once in a given network. Um, and then we can call Now, oh, it lists up all the components in our network by, no, like by the nodes contained in it. So we can see that we have one co component consisting of these four genes here. And we can look up, we see, oh, here we have a few components that are quite large. We want to see how big all of these different components are? We can do, okay. Um, size of different components. See that the biggest one here consists of 1,333 notes. The type of analysis you can do. I'm going to move this through a bit. Yeah, I'm going to skip all of that. Um, a further thing uh, we can look at is communities. Communities are it's, it's sort of the same uh, principle as components. The main difference between communities and components is that communities are not entirely disjoint. If we look at this network, this is a network um, of um, co-expression of uh, transcription factors in the human brain and in the chimpanzee brain. Um, and what we see here is that you have at least two very distinct groupings. Like, yeah, they connect through here, but this is mostly a grouping that's much more connected to itself then it connects to the rest. And often when you're looking at networks, you want to identify these communities. Um, this is not a very trivial uh, thing at times. With, you know, with components, it's very easy because a component is very clearly defined. But with communities, um, you don't, like, it, yeah, it, it's, a, it's a softer transition. Um, in order, to, so what we do have though is we have a couple of tools that provide ways of guessing this. Um, first of all, we want to see if the network does have a community structure. Sometimes you can have a network which is very homogenous, where there's not really any grouping, particular grouping of sets of nodes. But some networks like this, for instance. So if we were to look at this network, you don't like looking at here. You don't really have very obvious communities. Here, say you might have a community here, like this is a cluster that groups together and very thinly connected to this. But if you look at this one, it's pretty homogeneous. You don't really have a community structure here. So we have something called the modularity, which is a measure of the extent to which a network has a community structure. Uh, I'm not going to call up the equation here uh, because it's not really relevant. Um, but the, the main thing to keep in mind with this community, with this modularity, is that it's uh, it's a measure of, uh, for a given division of network into communities, how, how much do edges stick within a given community. And what you essentially want to do is you want to find a division where this uh, value is as high as possible. If you want to do that, uh, the only way of really knowing the maximum value is trying every possible combination. Uh, obviously, if, an, if you have a network with hundreds of, or even tens of nodes, the number of possible combinations becomes prohibitive and you can't really compute that. But 
that is an ongoing field is finding out heuristics that that get a reasonably good approximation uh, of what is the best uh, community decomposition of a given network um, within reasonable time. So um, this is also something that you can do not in network X directly, but people have created libraries um, like an add-on library for this specific purpose. Um, so let's bring this up um, and I'll show you how we can do that. So an example, a quick example network to run this analysis on. This is an extension of one of the first networks I showed you. Uh, it's a country border network for the entire current EU. Uh, what I count here are land borders as well as the two borders that have that aren't land borders but are connected by land infrastructure, meaning uh, the English Channel that has a train tunnel and uh, the Ersen Bridge, which connects. So we see here we connect Denmark to Sweden through here and France to the UK through this one uh, to simply keep the network a bit more interesting. Um, so let's try to do a community de decomposition of the EU. We First, import the community library, which is a separate library. Uh, then, um, yeah. we read in the network file. look a bit of at how this works. So we see an edge for each border, like the German-Polish border, Hungary-Slovakia, Lithuania-Poland, so on. So we can do um, uh, oh. and now this is a list of countries by which group they've been had in. This is not super easy, which, which community they've been grouped in geographically. Uh, this is not super easy to eat on its, on its own. So uh, let's try to move this into a bit of a more readable format where we want to list each community by the countries that are in it. So we can do initialize. A dict to hold all this, and then for a country in parts, I made this start a bit earlier. Essentially what it does is it goes through every element of this list and then throws um, and then uh, throws each country into the corresponding element in the communities dictionary. So if you now look here at communities, we see a division into five different groups. First is a sort of general Western Europe one consisting of Belgium, France, Germany, Spain, Netherlands, Portugal, and Luxembourg. Second is a Balkans one, I guess, uh, with Bulgaria, Greece, and Romania. The Nordic countries with Denmark, Finland, and Sweden. Central Europe with um, Croatia, Italy, Hungary, Austria, and Slovenia. So the old Habsburg lands there. Uh, Northeastern Europe with uh, Czech Republic, uh, Estonia, Latvia, no, sorry, yeah, Latvia, Lithuania, Slovakia, and Poland. Lastly, uh, sticking out is Ireland and the UK in their own group. Uh, it's sort of an interesting observation when I run this is that this is a good demonstration of why these algorithms can be somewhat arbitrary and there's, they're not necessarily going to be on the best partition. Because if you look here uh, at this part of the network, this is France, this here is the UK, and this is Ireland. Here is France, Spain, and Portugal. And from a topological perspective, these two branches are entirely equivalent. You can flip them over. Like th that would just readjust the labels. But we see that 
what this algorithm gives us is that it gives us Ireland and the UK in its own community, but not the same. Uh, but Spain and Portugal end up in the general Western Europe community, uh, which is just like an illustration of the fact that these algorithms will find a reasonable solution. I thought this is a like reasonable regional subdivision of Europe, but it's not. Yeah, it's not. But it occurred by chance. Yeah, well, if you were to seed it randomly differently, you can end up with a different result, is essentially what I'm saying, because there is no topological difference between these two branches of the network. Why is France connected to the UK? Because yeah, I added that for the, for the sake of showing this. Simply because if you were to, like, it's not interesting from network's perspective just to have, like, an edge of two or a set of... And I feel similarly, it didn't make sense to have Finland and Sweden as entirely distinct in that aspect. Because infra like infrastructurally, it is a very dense connection. It's, it is a very functional connection. Um, I actually decided to check what this community of the partition works. Not if you don't do just the EU, but if you do all of Europe. Um, so here, I include all of Europe, not just the EU. See, we add a few more countries. I'm not going to start too many controversial political discussions about what is included here as a country or not. I cut out all the, I did, however, cut out all the so called microstates like uh, Andorra, San Marino, so on, because they're not, like, they're, <laughs> they would be sort of, yeah, not really representative here. Um, so we can do the same here. Um, parts, community best partition here, and We see that the division is quite different. And this is also not the division I got when I ran it earlier in my office, uh, which shows simply the heuristics uh, work here. So you see here we get a quite large Western European group here, partially because you had um, you had Switzerland that was added in the middle here, which links uh, much of Central Europe to Western Europe. So suddenly, uh, for instance, you see here Austria and Italy have moved into the um, into Western Europe camp, as well as now the UK uh, and <coughs> Ireland. No, oh, okay, I messed something up there. But yeah, the UK and Ireland have also been added in the Western Europe community. Um, the second group here is the Balkans. See Bulgaria, Greece, Romania, as we saw before. Uh, yeah, so we we get. Uh, a different division, but it's still reasonably, um, reasonably sensible. Uh, for some reason, there's some, like it has several. Yes, I think I messed up my script here to add things. Yeah, there's something wrong with this because it adds over a couple of countries a few times. But this is generally the subdivision we get. I think you just need to uh, reset communities dictionary. Ah, yes. Good observation. All right, let's do this now. Yeah, this is much better. Here we go. Now we have the grouping the way I want it. Here we go. So we see we have the Western Europe bunch, which now includes also Ireland and the UK, Balkans, Nordic countries, and Eastern Europe minus the Balkans. Also minus, I think, what we have here, we got, yeah, Hungary got added into the Balkans for some reason. Uh, but it it's like, shows that, that these uh, like, net community detection, these are algorithms that often can be useful to find reasonably coherent groupings in a network without knowing anything further than just the topology of the network. Uh, for instance, like here it has Nordic countries, which is a clearly this defined cultural sphere, and that is not something that, is con like, that we told the network. We just showed which countries border each other. And community detection it kind of identifies structures like that, which is something you can often see if you're looking at networks, for instance, of genetic networks, and you do community detection there, and you find communities network of genes that suddenly you see, oh, these genes have a lot of things in common at the end of the day and are an interesting uh, topic of study. Uh, so, yeah, this is a bit of a demonstration of the type of analysis you can do in Network X. Um, and so, Network X is primarily. Uh, a library for doing analysis of network, finding uh, interesting nodes, identifying them uh, as such. It doesn't really do 
visualization as a primary purpose. It does, however, have uh, some basic functionality uh, for it uh, by interfacing with Matplotlib. So I can show a bit what that looks like. Um, All right, and then we do. Oh, God damn it, excellent over problems. All right, I'm not gonna be able to show that now. This worked last time I checked it, but it won't now. Um, yeah, but it's not really, I would not recommend network X to do visualization. If it does, like, it has function you can call and you can use it, use it as you go. But at the time where you want to have a figure for actual presentation, you're probably better off exporting the network and then re-importing it into a more graphical tool, such as Cytoscape. That's for instance what I've done here. If you were to look at this network here, is something where I did all the, the analysis in Network X. And once I was done, I exported uh, files containing all this data and read that into Cytoscape and used Cytoscape to do the coloring and the layout and all that stuff. So yeah, that is what I have to say about Network X, a little bit how to do network, like why you want to do network analysis, how to do some of the basics. Um, for, if you actually end up using it, I strongly recommend just relying heavily on documentation because it is very well documented and you're not gonna, yeah. It takes a while to remember most functions <laughs> by hand, like, or for them to stick, so you, yeah. That's, Pretty much my introduction to network X. Any questions? Yeah. Uh, this betweenness that you showed us. Yeah. The centrality between. Us, is this like finding the percolating the percolation threshold to your network? No, not really. No. Because the percolation threshold that's what you get if like you were to remove or uh, how what fraction of nodes you need to remove and still be able to keep a flow through the network. Yeah. Right. Do you do that? I don't know if there's any function that does that directly. Um, I mean, you could obviously write something yourself, uh, but for a given network, like, the problem here is if you're re removing something randomly, it sort of depends on what random removal you're doing, I guess, for a given network. Uh, I don't think like, like you have an easy function to do uh, to figure out the correlation right. threshold, but you can definitely write something in the context, all right, we have this network, pick, uh, a, a random selection of nodes, um, delete them, and then see how many components do we have. Because if you start with one giant component, and then you cut off and you end up with set with two components, then you cross the percolation threshold. Your network is now disjoint. That would be a way of doing it. Uh, but as far as I know, uh, the percolation threshold is not something you can directly compute in that. Any other questions? Yep. Yeah. Uh, I don't like it has like ten different formats. I'm not familiar with all of them, but I don't think any of them are binary formats per se. Not not network X. Well, uh, yeah, so I don't think Network X has a function for maximum clicks. No, no, it's not something that Network X is looking at. When I'm talking about clicks? When you talk about clicks? Or the community decomposition? Yeah, it, it, it is. And like community decomposition is MP complete in itself, which is why you have heuristics like al heuristic algorithms that try to solve it. So if I want, I can go a bit more into detail on how, um, on how the community um, algorithm or the, the source of the, the function I showed. Um, what it does is it starts by assigning every node to a community of its own. And then it computes the modular modularity, uh, which uh, I guess will have a pretty trivial value when you start with everything in a different node. And what it does is it, then it tries to iterate through all nodes and then moves 
nodes into neighboring communities and sees if that results in an increase of the modularity, so the quality of decomposition. And if it can increase the quality of decomposition by moving nodes from one neighbor to another, um, or from one community to the neighboring community, it does that. And it just keeps repeating that until you, you're no longer able to increase the quality of the decomposition. Well, I imagine that that would be different functions. I can bring up a list of what kind of functions you have in network X. Uh, let's see So, yeah, you have a bunch of different functions, and I imagine for several, some of the heuristics, you can choose different functions for different approaches. So, yeah. Yeah, I don't know if that answered your question or... Yeah, yeah. Okay. Right. And if you have more discussions, you can probably talk. Yeah, I'm going to stay around here for a little while. I hear there's pizza, so... So, yes... Speaking of that, as a show of our appreciation for your time coming out tonight, we bought you some dinner. So please, please feel free to help yourself. And now it can get crowded in the back there. So just don't be shy and grab some pizzas and throw them out on the tables so there's not too much traffic over in the back. So thanks for coming. Thank you, Andre. Thank you.